Hello, everyone. Welcome back for those who have been tuning in throughout the Maple Leaf Route webinar series this summer. And for those tuning in for the first time, hello and welcome. We're very happy to have you. As always, I am your host, Eric Story. I'm the Outreach Manager of the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada in Waterloo, Ontario, and a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wilfrid Laurier University. Now, before we begin tonight, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. It is encompassed by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples in 1701 and the Haldimand Proclamation signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown in 1784 following the American Revolution, which promised to the Haudenosaunee lands that extend six miles on either side of the Grand River from its source near Orangeville to Lake Erie. Today, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities, as well as the home of many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. Acknowledging the history of these two nations' presence and relationship in relationship to the land since time immemorial and through 300 years of treaty making is a, is a reminder that they remain the original stewards of the lands and waters upon which the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada resides. Tonight marks the last of our webinars in the Maple Leaf Route webinar series. I know it's very sad that the summer is coming to a close as is the second season of the Maple Leaf Route webinar series. Over the course of six webinars from May until tonight, many of you will know if you've been tuning in that you have learned about the role Canada has played in the Second World War. From the war on the sea, in the air and on the ground, to the experiences of First Nations peoples and the history and memory of the Dieppe Raid of 1942, you have been introduced to some of the broader themes of Canada fighting the Second World War, and we hope that throughout this series, some of the talks and things that our speakers have mentioned have prompted you to explore further the role of Canada and the second and Canada's role in the Second World War. Tonight, for our final webinar, however, we are not done just yet. We turn to the often overlooked role of service women fighting on the front lines during the war. But before I turn it over to our speaker this evening, I have just one final message from our sponsors. The Juno Beach Center would like to remind webinar attendees tonight of its commemorative brick program. Some of you might have seen it uh, in the PowerPoint that was on rotation before I uh, turned my camera and microphone on tonight. Located outside of the center, the Juno Beach Center in Normandy, France, visitors can find over 13,000 names of soldiers engraved on these bricks. Each year, new bricks are installed leading up to November 11th, um, leading up to, to Remembrance Day, November 11th. The end of September marks the final call for new submissions, so please consider supporting the Juno Beach Centre by sponsoring a commemorative brick. Your brick can pay tribute to a veteran, be in the name of the donor, a group, or school. And I'll make sure to share the uh, link for where you need to go in order to um, contribute to the commemorative brick program shortly. Now, before again, I turn things over to our speaker, I just have two brief reminders that I always say to our audience, and I, I know I sound like um, sound like someone that's just on repeat all the time, but I do like to remind folks that if you are needing closed captioning, um, you could turn those on by clicking the CC button located at the bottom of your window. And if a question comes to you at any point during the presentation, as always, please enter it into the Q&A, click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your window and enter in your question. And when you enter in your question, please, please let us know where you're coming from because as always, it's just a genuine pleasure to know exactly where everybody is tuning in from and sort of the geographical spread of our attendees. Now, without any further delay, I would now like to introduce your speaker for this evening, Stacy Barker. Stacy is a histor is historian arts and military history at the Canadian War Museum. She received her doctorate in history from the University of Ottawa in 2008 and has contributed to many exhibitions at both the Canadian War Museum and the Canadian Museum of History. 
Dr. Barker's most recent publication is the co-authored book, Material Traces of War, Stories of Canadian Women and Conflict, 1914 to 45. Very topical for tonight's talk, and we actually have it available for 20% off um, for those tuning in tonight. And again, I'll make sure to share with you uh, the information that you need in order to uh, get that 20% discount. Um, available directly through the University of Ottawa Press. You can also purchase her other earlier co-authored book, uh, Women, is it World War Women, Stacey? I wrote Women at War, but I remember it's World War Women. Um, and you can purchase that through the Juno Beach Center's online store. Again, I will share that link with you. I've already spoken too much, taken up too much of your time and Stacey's time. So I'll turn things over to her um, to speak about her presentation on Canadian service women during the Second World War. Stacey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, I am going to talk about service women during the Second World War uh, through the eyes of three women in particular. Um, but before we start... Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, so some of you might know that in 1941 and 1942, Canada opened three new military branches for women, uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division, or the WDs, the Canadian Women's Army Corps, or the CWACs, and the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service, also known as the RENs, and about 46,000 women served in those three branches. And tonight, as I said, I want to talk about the wartime experiences of three of those women. Uh, next slide, please. You can see them on the screen right now. They are Wing Officer Willow Walker, Lieutenant Molly Lamb Bobak, and Private Minnie Eleanor Gray. But before we get to their particular stories, I want to take you back to the beginning of the war when opportunities for Canadian women who wanted to serve were very limited. Um, nursing was in fact the only path into the military for women at the time. And during the Second World War, over 4,400 women served as military nurses. But of course, in order to do that, you had to be a trained nurse. So it wasn't a pathway that was open to everyone. And this had been the case during the First World War as well. And nothing had really changed during the interwar years. Uh, next slide, please. So when the Second War began, Second World War began, sorry, <laughs> some women very much wanted to serve in a military capacity. Uh, they believed strongly that they had a lot to offer, if only they were given the opportunity. So across the country, uniformed women's service groups or women's service corps were formed. Uh, following examples that had been set during the First World War when such groups also flourished. These were essentially paramilitary organizations. The members wore uniforms, they adopted rank systems, they trained, all in preparation for either home defense needs or if the day ever came for formal military service. The leaders of the Women's Service Corps movement, such as British Columbia's Joan Kennedy, pushed for greater involvement for women in the military. They lobbied, they lobbied hard and their lobbying efforts included a trip to Ottawa in 1940 to meet with officials where they presented their case for military service for women. Next slide, please. And in 1941, as you can see from these headlines, their efforts finally paid off. Uh, a perfect storm had gathered paving the way for women in uniform. Military manpower, emphasis on manpower, was beginning to tighten and suddenly the idea of enlisting women wasn't out of the question. And also, as an aside, uh, British service women were coming to Canada to work with the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, which was a massive program to train allied air personnel on Canadian soil. And their presence was going to prompt some perhaps uncomfortable questions as to why Canadian women weren't being given the same opportunities. So the Canadian military softened their stance on the enlistment of women and the Royal Canadian Air Force went first, announcing the creation of the Canadian Women's Auxiliary Air Force, which would later become the Women's Division. This was soon followed by the Canadian Army, announcing the establishment of the Canadian Women's Army Corps. And then in 1942, 
by the Royal Canadian Navy with the creation of the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. And now, women who wished to support the war effort had more options. And the women who enlisted came from all over the country. They came from all backgrounds, uh, like male recruits. They each had their own personal motivations for serving. And still, there were a few common themes. Uh, patriotism, a sincere feeling that this war needed to be fought and needed to be won. And they wanted to help win that fight. Also, perhaps a desire for adventure, something new. For some, the opportunity to travel, to get away from home, hometowns, and out into the wider world. And for others, the prospect of vocational training or even a steady paycheck drove their decisions to enlist. And of course, social pressure, peer pressure may have played a part in decisions as well, showing that you were patriotic, that you were doing something for the war effort to help win the fight must have factored into some individual decisions to enlist. As I mentioned earlier, over 46,000 women served in these branches, meaning essentially there were over 46,000 different sets of motivations, wartime stories, and legacies. Next slide, please. So tonight I'd like to begin with Willa Walker, who you can see here. She was born Willa McGee in 1913, and she came from a fairly privileged background. Her father was Lieutenant Colonel Alan Angus McGee, DSO. McGee was a lawyer who'd commanded the 148th Battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force during the First World War, and he'd served as a general staff officer for Arthur Curry. He was also on General Curry's legal team when Curry sued a newspaper for libel in the late 1920s. So Willa McGee had attended good schools and she traveled widely as a young woman. And in 1939, shortly before the war began, she married Captain David Harry Walker, who was an officer with Britain's Black Watch. Walker was serving as an aide-de-camp for Canada's Governor General at the time, John Bucket. But when the war broke out, David Walker returned to England. He returned to his regiment and he fought at Dunkirk. He didn't make it back to England. For months afterwards, Willa didn't know whether David was alive or dead. And finally, word came. He was a prisoner of war. And Willa did what she could to help his escape attempts. Uh, she sent him coded letters. She sent him hidden maps in his POW parcels. And at home, she started a group called the Canadian Prisoners of War Relatives Association. And she did all this, grieving the loss of their young son, who died in February 1941. Next slide, please. And then in the summer of 1941, when the Air Force announced that it would begin enlisting women, Willa Walker was among the first applicants. You can see her here in the front row on my left. On the left, I guess, it's just left. Um, but why did she join? Uh, it's possible she was looking for a more focused way to support the war effort, uh, a way to fill the hours spent waiting and worrying about her husband, about the war. According to one news article about Walker, before she enlisted, quote unquote, the long days dragged. In September of that year, the Air Force selection boards interviewed applicants in major Canadian cities. And during this process, 150 women were selected for the first training course to be held in Toronto. From this group, the CWAF would select its first officers and NCOs. And Walker was part of this initial group of 150. And in October, she traveled to Toronto to begin her Air Force career. The next slide, please. It began, as most military careers do, with basic training. Officers on loan from Britain's Women's Auxiliary Air Force, along with male RCAF personnel, were the trainers who taught this first group of women military fundamentals. So on a typical day in basic training, Walker, then airwoman second class, would wake up at 6.30 a.m., have breakfast, parade, for the next nine and a half hours, attend an assortment of lectures, drills, training courses, interrupted only for lunch. After supper, the lights would go out at 10.30, and then they would do it all over again the next day. And this wasn't easy. Um, these civilian women had to be transformed into effective military leaders. They were going to be officers. As another newspaper article about Walker noted, it was a steep learning curve for her 
She struggled to make her bed the Air Force way. She fell over her feet on the parade ground, trying to learn drill and took her inoculations. And at the conclusion of this five week course, she and the other recruits underwent a series of exams to make sure that they were ready, not just to serve and obey orders, but also to give them as officers themselves. Now, whether it was her family background, her experience at boarding school, or just natural ability, Walker had an aptitude for the military. She won the Brooks Medal, named for Air Commodore, later Air Vice Marshal George Brooks, as the top recruit in her class. Her training complete, Walker began her meteoric rise up the ladder. One of her initial tasks, though, was integrating the first draft of trained CWAF recruits into British Commonwealth Air Training Plant facilities. And that wasn't always simple. Not all RCAF personnel, including commanding officers, welcomed the arrival of women. But as the liaison between RCAF and CWAF, Walker persisted. And eventually, as she stated, some of the stations which were the least enthusiastic are the most enthusiastic now. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, and here is Walker standing in front of some of her recruits. Meanwhile, the CWAF became the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division, the WDs. This was more than just a name change. It meant that women in the Air Force no longer served as auxiliaries, but as full members. And Walker, now holding the rank of squadron officer, was posted to Ottawa, to Rockcliffe, where hundreds of recruits a month were being trained. In 1943, she was posted to RCAF HQ and named Senior Staff Officer in Canada for the WDs. Next slide, please. So winning the Brooks Medal had foreshadowed things to come. Walker attained the rank of wing officer and she was the first in the WDs to do so. Wing officer was equivalent in rank to wing commander for men. And you can see the three stripes on her sleeve indicating her rank on her uniform that's now in the collection of the Canadian War Museum. In a war where many women were accomplishing firsts Walker's achievement was considered newsworthy, but you'll notice that it was still relegated to the for and about page for women. Women were doing great things in the war, but in the public's eye, or at least some of the public's eye, women, they remained. A handful of other WDs would attain the rank of wing officer, but that proved to be the limit as to how high women in the RCAF could climb up the ranks. In the summer of 1944, word came that David Walker might be released in a prisoner exchange. And with that possibility in mind, Willa Walker asked for her retirement from the RCAF so she could go meet her husband upon his release. They'd been apart for several years. That autumn, she was duly transferred to the RCAF Reserve General Section, and she then went to Scotland to wait for him. As it turned out, he remained a POW until 1945 when he was liberated by Allied troops. But once reunited, the Walkers eventually settled in New Brunswick, where David Walker began a successful career as a novelist. Willa Walker raised a family, worked on a variety of local causes and projects until her death in 2010 at age 97. And next slide, please. So Willa Walker, she you see her here in the center. Her experience in the military was atypical. She attained the highest rank possible for women in the Air Force at the time. And she belonged to the select and small group of women who made up the leadership cadre of the women's services. She experienced the war from the top down, but of course, most service women did not. The next service woman that I wanna discuss had a much different experience. And yet she too was atypical in many ways. The first part of her military career was pretty conventional but she spent the latter part of the war doing something no other service woman got to do. Next slide, please. So Molly Lamb. Molly Lamb was a bit younger than Willa Walker. She was born in 1920. Her father, Harold Mortimer Lamb, was an art critic and a patron of the arts in Vancouver. Her mother, Mary Williams, fostered her daughter's own obvious artistic talent and encouraged her to attend art school, which she did, graduating from the Vancouver School of Art. We know from her memoirs that Lamb enlisted in Vancouver in 1942 at the age of 22, and that she had immediate second thoughts 
calling her mother, who promised she would try to get her out of it. But that wasn't necessary. Within a few days, Lamb had pushed her doubts aside, and she was more than ready to embark on her new life as a CWAC. Now, many of you probably already know, Lamb is far better known today as Molly Lamb Bobak, renowned Canadian artist, the only official woman to be a war artist to serve in uniform during the Second World War. Now, while Lamb herself was not an average CWAC, her war art reveals the lives of those who were. As a servicewoman and an artist, Lamb documented this pivotal moment in Canadian military history and in the history of Canadian women. And she left a remarkable body of work now in the collection of the Canadian War Museum. But again, as I mentioned, before she was an official war artist, Molly Lamb was a recruit like the others. Like Walker, she went for basic training, which in Lamb's case meant being sent to Verbillion, Alberta, to the CWAC training center that was located there. She was sent in December, and for Lamb, who you'll remember was from Vancouver, it was a bit of a shock, and she wrote that it was the first time she'd ever been to Alberta and had ever felt a real winter cold. Next slide, please. So members of the CWAC underwent four weeks basic training, and in a few of Lamb's eventual war works, uh, she reflects this early period in her Army career. Uh, this one depicts Lamb's CWAC comrades as they, like Willow Walker, learned how to live a life that was foreign to them. Here, she's depicting CWAC recruits learning a very basic military stance, how to stand at ease. Next slide, please. And in this work, which is my very favorite Molly Lamb Bowback work, Lamb has depicted them donning gas masks for gas drill. She's shown them as they train in the winter, remember, on the snow-covered ground. One CWAC is in the background. She seems to be struggling with her respirator. And the other recruits stand at various angles. They look a little awkward. That's because Lamb later noted that they couldn't really hear the sergeant with their gas masks on. After basic training came trades training, and the Army tried to match recruits with jobs for which they had some experience or at least some aptitude for Lamb with her art training. That meant becoming an Army draftswoman. Her initial task was to produce mechanical drawings, and uh, later she drew meat cutting charts. Somewhat better was her assignment to paint scenery and create backdrops for the Army show, which was the Army's in house entertainment unit. For most service women, the jobs they filled were a little bit mundane. They were, after all, non combatants. The women of the CWAC, the WDs, and the RENs filled support roles. But it's important to note that while many of these jobs do seem like women's work, especially in the context of the 1940s, these were all jobs that had been previously done by men in the services. By doing them, they were able to free up men for service closer to the battlefield and indeed the battlefield itself. Next slide, please. So what did the CWACs do? Food service, for example. Here, Molly Lamb has depicted a CWAC corporal tending to a stove. And in the background, you can see just about see a throng of army personnel. War was a hungry business and cooks were in great demand in the women's services. Next slide, please. And here in Private Roy, Lamb depicts Eva May Roy, who was a CWAC working in a canteen. Roy later rose to the rank of sergeant, but she was a private when Lamb observed her and made her the subject of one of her artworks. And this is, incidentally, also one of the rare portraits we have of a Black Canadian servicewoman from the Second World War, also one of my very favorites. Next slide, please. Another not so glamorous job for CWAX was laundry. Uh, but again, I think it's very important to point out that as prosaic as these seemed, they were vital, they needed to be done, they supported the vast military effort that was needed to win the war. Next slide. And as that war went on, more roles opened up for women. And this too was reflected in Lamb's work. For example, some members of the CWAC worked as drivers and mechanics. You can see that on the left. Uh, some members of the CWAC worked uh, in the Signal Corps 
And as the war went on, and as the need for more and more personnel grew, so too did the opportunities for women and the number of trades that they could do expanded. Next slide, please. So Lamb was sent to Toronto to do her army drafting course. And while she was there, although this, this painting depicts Ottawa, sorry. Uh, but while she was in Toronto, she met frequently with a family friend, group of seven painter A.Y. Jackson. In the summer of 1943, here she was posted to Ottawa to work on technical drawings. And she arrived in a city that was just teeming with activity, bursting at the seams with servicemen, service women, government workers, officials of all sorts. Next slide, please. And this busyness was true of so many places in Canada during the war. It was an active time. Everyone, it seemed, had a role to play in what was, after all, a total war effort. Now, this work I'm showing you here is not by Molly Lamb, but by another SUAC, who was an unofficial war artist, Beulah Jenicky. This scene uh, shows a very busy Ottawa restaurant. I think it was Murray's. At the height of the war, it gives you an idea of just how packed the city was. Um, women who joined the services may have, in many cases, been doing everyday jobs, but they were doing them in a, in a heightened atmosphere. Um, the bustle of wartime was exciting. Their jobs gave them a feeling of purpose. Lamb didn't leave the impression that she liked Ottawa all that much. Um, she later recalled that it was humid and sweltering, and it certainly is humid and sweltering uh, in the summer, and that their CWAC uniforms wouldn't stay pressed in the heat. The army fed them things like stew, but she used her time in Ottawa very well. After she enlisted and after the Second World War official art program was announced, she had one key ambition, to become an official war artist. Through her father, she knew people like legendary Canadian artists Fred Varley and the aforementioned A.Y. Jackson, both of whom had been official war artists during the First World War. And while she was in Ottawa, she visited with H.O. McCurry, who was head of the National Gallery of Canada, and who was instrumental in getting that Second World War official art program established, which happened in 1943. So Molly Lamb, CWAC, sketched, she painted, she networked, and in 1944, she entered an army art competition, and she placed second. Now, this contest was pivotal because it helped build Molly Lamb's name and her reputation as an artist, and it brought her dream to fruition she soon became the only woman service artist, service artist, sorry, that Canada would appoint, joining 31 other official artists, all men. Next slide, please. So being appointed war artist meant a promotion for Lamb to Lieutenant, and that meant officer's training. So Lamb made her way to St. Anne de Bellevue in Quebec, which is just outside of Montreal to undergo her eight weeks of officer's training. And this work by Lamb is a reflection of her time at officer training. Uh, it's of the train station at St. Anne's. And you can see that it is just teeming with sea wax. In the late spring of 1945, Lamb was finally sent overseas to paint. And in London, she was assigned to share studio space with another official war artist. As it happens, the winner of that army art contest, Bruno Bobak. Next slide, please. So by the time Lamb arrived in England, CWAX had been stationed there for a few years. Along with members of the WDs and the Rens, they fulfilled a range of roles in Britain and Lamb set out to capture that in her art. This work here on the left, Canadian Women's Army Corps coming to work at Fairfax House shows some of them. Fairfax House was where the war artists had their headquarters. So Lamb would have known this building quite well. Another scene on the right, is uh, shows CWAX busy at Canadian military headquarters garage in London. And it was on Dilk Street, which was right near the Royal Hospital, which is where the Chelsea pensioners, veterans lived. And Lamb included one of them in her painting here. You can see him in his red uniform talking to a CWAC. Next slide, please. But Lamb didn't just depict her fellow CWAX at work. Uh, she also documented other aspects of their lives while they were overseas. Uh, for example, in the watercolor on top on the left, she shows them playing baseball, uh, a popular recreational pastime for Canadian military personnel. Or in the pencil sketch, just sitting quietly, having a break, 
chatting. Or at the bottom, uh, an everyday scene of life in wartime London. Here we see a, a diverse cast of characters, service personnel from different countries, waiting for a bus alongside British civilians. Lamb didn't just depict sea wax in isolation. She showed them in their element, integrated into the landscape of wartime. Next slide, please. Now, Lamb's time overseas also included several weeks in Europe where she got to witness firsthand the devastation of war. You can see from the work on the left, ruins in the town of Emmerich, Germany. And there were other sea wax posted to Northwest Europe, and you can see some of them in the next painting, sea wax on the, in Amsterdam. Next slide, please. Later in 1945, Lamb returned home to Canada. She completed her war art assignment and she buried Bruno Bobak, with whom she shared a studio in London. Like other women in the military, she was discharged as the CWAX, along with the WDs and the RANS, were disbanded in 1946. And what, you're, what I'm showing you here is the Bobak's wedding photo. You can see they're still in their uniforms, Molly in the middle, of course, Bruno on the right, and on the left is Bruno's best man, fellow war artist Abba Bayevsky, who was in the Air Force. So Molly Lamb Bobak, she went on to have a long and successful career as an artist and her work can be found in many collections along with the War Museum, including the National Gallery of Canada. And she passed away in 2014. So both Willow Walker and Molly Lamb were in their own ways products of middle-class abundance. Walker, the daughter of a well-connected Montreal lawyer and Lamb, who grew up in a somewhat bohemian yet comfortable household. They had support networks and were able to flourish in the military thanks to their own talents, yes, but also no doubt because of that support. And the last service woman I wanna to discuss tonight came from a very different background. Next slide, please. So a few years ago, a collection of artifacts came into the care of the Canadian War Museum and they belonged to private mini Eleanor Gray. And the collection included a, a CWAC uniform, hers, her metal set, her handwritten journal, albums filled with photos and clippings, and a few assorted objects and documents related to her wartime service and her life as a veteran. Next slide, please. Here's Minnie, she is on the right in this photo. We don't actually know very much about Minnie Gray's early life, but what we do know indicates that it probably wasn't that easy uh, and certainly very different from either Walker or Lamb's childhoods. Gray was from Wolfville, Nova Scotia. She was born in 1912. She was black. She'd been orphaned as a small child. By 1921 at age eight, we know she was living at the township of Horton Poor Farm, which was a care home for orphans and adults who were unable to live on their own. She lived there for a time, and when she was a teenager, she became the foster daughter of the local family. We know that as a young woman, she worked as a domestic servant and a childcare provider in the years before the war. Now, systemic racism made it difficult for Black Canadians to enlist early on in the war, but restrictions eased as the war went on. In January 1944, at age 32, Minnie Gray joined the Canadian Women's Army Corps. It may not have been her first attempt to enlist. I've actually found anecdotal information that she tried once before earlier in the war and was turned down. Um, why that was, you can draw some conclusions. Uh, but what we do know is for a fact is that she was accepted in the army in 1944. The next slide, please. Here she is in the back row on the very left. So like Molly Lamb, she followed up her basic training with trades training, and she went to Chorley Park Military Hospital in Toronto, where she qualified as a nursing orderly, and here's her, her class photo. Next slide, please. She applied her trade in Kitchener, Ontario, for about six months, and then she got news that her military life was about to take an interesting turn. Now, most CWACs, indeed, most service women serve in Canada, but many, perhaps all, harbored a desire for overseas service. Minnie Gray was one of them. 
And she was also one of the fortunate ones who was chosen to go overseas, which she did in July 1945 as part of a draft of 250 CWACs heading across the Atlantic to Great Britain. Next slide, please. So great. When she got to England, she was stationed at Aldershot to await her ultimate posting. And in early August, after several weeks of waiting and wondering what her assignment would be, her suspense ended. And she left her impressions of this in her wartime journal, which I mentioned is now in the collection of the Canadian War Museum. At last it came, she wrote. I was called into Sergeant Bodley's office and I was informed that I was going to the continent as MO to the pipe band. What a day, what a break. I certainly never expected anything as perfect as that. The kids, meaning her CWAC colleagues, were as excited as I about my posting. They would have given anything to be in my shoes. Next slide, please. So many Gray's posting to the CWAC pipe band, bagpipe band, was not as a musician. To my knowledge, she did not know how to play the bagpipes or the drums, but rather as a medical orderly. And this was a coveted posting, not only because she got to serve in continental Europe, which only a relatively small number of service women got to do, but also because the pipe band was a bit of a wartime sensation. Playing concerts all over Canada, parts of the United States, and drawing attention wherever they went. The band had formed in 1942, and they were led by pipe major Lillian Grant, a bagpiper from Victoria, B.C., band toured across Canada, playing for civilians and troops, helping with recruiting drives, and, and generally boosting the profile of the women's services, helping them convey a wholesome image to a country still not entirely sure what to make of women in uniform. When women first entered the military outside of the nursing role, Canadian society had to adapt to this new phenomenon, and not everyone was keen. The sight of women in uniform challenged received notions of gender and the roles that women were supposed to fulfill in wartime. And it was feared that this negative impression was harming recruitment. The pipe band, along with another separate brass band, it was hoped could showcase a wholesome image to skeptics. And this even extended to the uniforms. Um, kilts, of course, are a normal and indeed expected garb for pipe band members, but the CWAC band was not allowed to wear them because they would reveal their knees. Now, Minnie Gray knew some of the pipe band members already. They'd come over to Britain on the same ship, and she'd also crossed paths with some of them in Canada. But she'd come to know them a lot better in the months ahead. After crossing the, the channel, she traveled to the Netherlands, where the pipe band would be based for their tour of Northwest Europe. Next slide. Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> So along the way, like Molly Lamb, who was also in Northwest Europe around the same time, sketching and painting, Minnie Gray witnessed the aftermath of war. And she wrote in her journal, there were whole streets of houses with no windows, parked with bullet holes, half of houses standing, children looking half starved and scared of the convoy going by. It was a heartbreaking sight. This is a painting by George Campbell Tinning. Shows a little bit of the... Um, aftermath of war in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. So Gray accompanied the pipe band on their trip, first to Germany, where they played for Canadian troops who were stationed there, and then back to the Netherlands for more concerts, then on to Belgium and France, where the pipe band, Gray noted, made the front pages of the Paris papers twice in one week. And here they are piping past the Arc de Triomphe. Next slide, please. So actually, as I mentioned, Molly Lamb was in Northwest Europe at the same time, and she sketched the pipe band during their time in the Netherlands, and you can see one here. Lovely sketch, really, really lovely stuff. Next slide. And here's another one, this might be difficult to see, but it's a Canadian Women's Army Corps pipe band writing letters home at their quarters, Jasper Lodge, Appledorn, Holland. So at the end of the pipe band's tour of Northwest Europe, uh, Minnie Gray said farewell to the Netherlands, where according to her, the happiest days of my army career were spent. She and the band and the rest of the entourage were back in Britain 
by December. Back to Varric's life again, she wrote. Don't like it one little bit. Guess we had things too free and easy in Holland. In Britain, the damp and cold conditions took their toll on the band members, and one by one, they found themselves sick, with Grey ministering to their sore throats, their head colds, their other assorted ailments. Grey was under the weather too, but she kept to her duties. She did note that this was, quote, bad weather for Canadians, unquote. So in January, word came that they were going home, something that caused mixed feelings among the group. For as Gray wrote, some of us were very happy and some weren't. I didn't want to go home just yet. I had just begun to like the country and wanted very much to be in England in the spring. Next slide, please. So Minnie Gray arrived in Toronto in early February, 1946. The pipe band was disbanded and Gray left for Montreal then back to Nova Scotia. She was home. Minnie Gray's war was over. Next slide, please. But the impact of her war service remained. Like many women who'd served, her life course was shifted by her experiences. Gray parlayed the trades training she received in the army into a career, a peacetime career. In 1947, she graduated from a course in practical nursing at the Parker School for trained attendants in Montreal. And she went on to work with babies and young children. Next slide, please. So the personal connections and the friendships that Minnie Gray made in the army remained as well. She stayed in touch with her former CWAC comrades for decades, including the pipe band. She went to reunions and even much later on, Gray asserted that those six months with the pipe band had been the highlight of her life. Minnie Gray died in 2005, a veteran, proud of her service until the end of her life. She was buried in the National Field of Honor Cemetery in Point Claire, Quebec. Uh, next slide, please. So Willa Walker, Molly Lamb Bobak, Minnie Gray. These are three Canadian women from different parts of the country, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic circumstances, but they all had one thing in common. They all decided to enlist in the military during a time of war. And that's a significant decision on its own, but in the 1940s, they carried with them the additional burden of being among the first women to do so in a role other than nursing. They stepped outside the bounds of traditional women's roles with no clear idea of how they would be received nor how this would impact their lives. Every woman who joined the services had to face that uncertainty. For someone like Molly Lamb, whose family background was a little bit unconventional to begin with, joining the military was likely yet another adventure, deviation from the norm perhaps. For Gray, whose personal circumstances already put her on the margins, military service arguably could offer her both risks and rewards. And for someone like Walker, whose family military connections were strong, taking on a leadership role in the new women's services may have seemed a natural fit, but for each of these women, it was a leap of faith. And another important thing that these women have in common is the fact that they left something of their war service behind. And that's one of the reasons that we could tell their stories at all. Molly Lamb, for example, uh, left ample documentation about her military life. During the war, she kept a, a whimsical illustrated war diary, which is now in the collection of Library and Archives Canada, and which I encourage you to seek out. I believe they've digitized uh, the entire thing. She also wrote of her CWAC days in a published memoir entitled Wildflowers of Canada. And there's her art, of course, which we have at CWM. Minnie Gray left a wartime journal and letters, her uniform, other items, which we also have at CWM. And her story is actually among those featured in the exhibition Forever Changed, which I believe runs until September 5th. Um, so if you haven't seen it, go ahead, it's, it's wonderful. Um, the War Museum also has Willa Walker's uniform and Lack has several scrapbooks and photo albums relating to her service. So because they left these, these things behind, we're able to reconstruct and talk about their experience. And not every service woman did that, of course. And our book that um, we mentioned earlier, Material Traces of War, 
uh, which I co-authored with two of my former colleagues, Krista Cook and Molly McCullough, we also present some of these stories, including the three that I touched on tonight. And we did so simply because we wanted to highlight the wartime experiences of Canadian women. Now, in closing, I just want to touch on something that I've noticed over the years. Um, these three women, of course, they've all passed and their cohort, that generation of women who served during the Second World War is, is almost gone. And as they left us, I've been struck by the number whose obituary photos depict them in uniform. And I've often wondered about that. Now, perhaps it's a choice their families make, or maybe these images are chosen because they show the women young and in their prime. Um, but to me, their inclusion always speaks of pride. These women knew that they had done something important and hard, and their war service marked them as individuals and as a generation. It's important to me that historians of war, and in this war in particular, don't overlook them, but recognize the significance of their service to themselves, to the war effort, and uh, to the wider history of women in Canada. Thank you. Well, Stacey, thank you so much for a, a tremendous talk. Um, just so vivid, the photos and illustrations and artwork that you had were just tremendous. Um, but I think that's something that we should all expect coming from someone at a museum, of course. Um, so let me uh, get my screen all ready to go here. And then we can, we can get right into the Q&A um, portion of, of tonight's talk. Um, what I'll do, and this is what I, I typically do, Stacey, actually, sorry, I got to make sure that you are not spotlighted here. There we go. So now we're together. Um, what I normally do is for the Q&A is I, I'd like to start off with some of the kind of um, um, shorter type of questions that you can answer quickly, and then we can go um, to more of the uh, kind of deliberative questions. Um, but I'm going to take uh, chair's um, priority here and ask a question to you that I've I've just thought of here, um, which turns out to be not actually a short answer question, but a long answer question. So I'm already breaking rules that I've created for myself. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the process um, of when someone donates, um, you know, collections or materials to a museum. I'm, I'm curious if you could go through maybe even the case of, of, um, uh, of Gray, what the process of, you know, receiving collections or a family member reaching out and what goes into the process of actually getting a material um, mm -hmm. donated and then received at the museum. Well, first, I'll have to preface that by saying that as a historian at the museum, I, I don't actually handle any of the collection side. Um, there are mm -hmm. collection specialists who, who do that. Uh, that's their job, right. and, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, but I do know roughly what happens. Um, the donation uh, offers uh, come from a variety of sources. People, sometimes they just walk into the museum. <laughs> um, sometimes they'll email, they'll phone, they'll say, you know, we have this from, you know, auntie dad, whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and then what usually happens is the um, collections specialist will ask for more information, photographs, and then there's like a donation form that gets sent out and a lot of information gets filled in and there's back and forth that goes on. And then that will go through a collections committee that uh, decides, you know, is this something that should be in the collection because we can't take everything, of course, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's not enough room. Um, but so uh, that's yeah. roughly what happens. And um, yeah. That's... Okay. Um, first non-chair question for this okay. evening um, coming to you. Well, there's actually a number of people have asked this question, so I'm just going to ask it all from, from an, on behalf of a number of different folks um, mm -hmm. regarding pay and pay equity. Yeah. Uh, were women paid the equivalent of men in no. similar or same positions? No, they weren't. Um, they were initially paid two-thirds of a man's salary, um, and that later went up at some point in the war, I can't remember the exact date, to about three quarters, no, to three quarters of a man's salary. And the reasoning behind that was these women weren't putting themselves in danger um, as a man would. There was no expectation that they were, they're not armed. They're not going into combat. Um, whether or not you buy that, I mean, this was the 1940s and women were not, there was no equal pay really anywhere. So it's just kind of the standard thing. Um, but no, they were not, uh, they were not paid equally. <laughs> 
Um, next question coming from Jeff Austin in Calgary. Um, his is about um, how many approximately women ended up going overseas. And if you have yeah. a sense of, um, you know, how many ended up in Europe versus mm -hmm. other kind of theaters of war, even if there's an, if you're able to break those down in a little bit more detail. Yeah, I have the numbers, of course, this always it's funny how little we know <laughs> when it comes to numbers. Um, yeah. But this, the uh, stat that I've seen is around one in nine members of the women's branches were posted overseas, so around 5,000 in total. Um, I'm looking at the numbers here for the RANs, about 1,000, the CWACs, about 3,000, the WDs, about 1,500. And of course, on top of that, you've got nurses, whom I didn't really talk about tonight, but 2,600 went overseas. Um, so in total, around 8,000 women would have been posted overseas. And I don't have a breakdown for like different theaters and whatnot, but I do know that, hold on, I'm scrolling, scrolling through, my, through my stat notes here. I think several hundred were posted to Northwest Europe. But don't quote me on that. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, a small number of CVACs sent to Northwest Europe. Well, they were still fighting on about 200, but then several hundred more were sent after the fighting ended. So they weren't really sent over when things were hot. Um, they waited mostly until things were, were cool. And, you know, there was a huge army that needed to be repatriated. So there was a lot of, a lot of clerical work that needed to be done. A lot of, right. A lot of support work. Right. Um, next question from, from someone whose name is not in here, so I'm sorry that I'm not able to include your name, um, but their question kind of going along with kind of the statistical or statistics-based questions. Do you have a sense of um, the, the age or the average age in which these women are enlisting? And if they tended to be older or younger than the men who were also enlisting? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't actually know. Um, I do know that at the beginning of the war, the age range was, was smaller I think it was like 21 to 21 to 40, perhaps. But then as they needed more personnel, they broadened that age range 18 to 45. And it, there were always exceptions, right? Uh, sometimes yeah. an older woman could get in and people would lie about their age if they were younger and wanted, really wanted in. Mm -hmm. I do know that the, the need for cooks was so extreme at some point that that's one of the reasons they um, expanded the eligibility requirements for women. So you could be a little bit older and right. uh, how do I say it? A little bit less physically fit. Um, yeah. So, so, but I really don't know um, if the women tended to be older or younger. And that's a really good question. And I'm going to write that down for further research. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. <laughs> um, you, sp you spoke about food just now, Stacey, yeah. and I know that's something uh, that you've done in past research before. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about that kind of relationship between service women who served and also food. Well, um, there's, there's two ways you can approach the food question during war. There's civilian food and there's military food. And of course, right. soldiers eat a lot. They need a lot of calories. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they needed a lot of cooks. And women, of course, that's something that they do. Uh, that's one of the roles that they could take over so that the men could be freed up for roles that were a little bit closer to the front line. They get closer, they get closer. Eventually, you end up with more combat troops. So that was uh, that's from that perspective. Of course, the civilian angle. Um, yeah, I wrote my PhD on, on, on food in Canada during the Second World War. And um, is there anything in particular you'd like to know? <laughs> <laughs> Just specifically more, let's let's focus more on the on the war front since your topic is more on on service women in the war. Because mm -hmm. you noticed that or you noted that earlier, um, a lot of these women ended up serving as cooks. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm I'm curious, you know, if if of course, I'm. Sh I'm. Sh I have no doubts that gender played a role in this, and and women being, you know, um, the cooks of the families, mm -hmm. providing for men, putting food on the table, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but is there is there anything more that's kind of stuck out to you when looking at that um, kind of role that service women played um, in preparing food for for male soldiers? Well, I, one thing that that's always struck me about this, and I kept I kept bringing it up in the um, in the talk, was that. You have to remember that these were all men's jobs, right? That the women yeah. were stepping into. So whether it was cooking or whether it was laundry or whether it was, you know, clerking, whatever they were doing, they were taking over a man's job. So even right. though on the surface, these look like women's jobs, cooking, very highly gendered as a woman's mm -hmm. job role, whatever task, um, 
in the military context, you have to think about it not as a woman's job. It just happens to be filled by women now because we think, well, they can do that because we need to send more men to the front. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just looking through some of the questions here um, for you, Stacy. Um, there's a question. I, I can't remember if, you, if you've answered this already, so I'm sorry if you have, but uh, from Lloyd Scalen um, asking about um, uh, were there any women who served in the RCAF? Yeah, uh, the WDs. Yeah. yeah the, the RCAF Women's Division uh, had about uh, 17,000 women served as WDs. And right. they would have served on, um, a lot of them would have served on British Commonwealth Air Training Plan bases in Canada, different facilities. Um, they would have worked mm -hmm. uh, as parachute packers. They would have worked uh, as clerks in all sorts of roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's a number of questions here about kind of post-war experiences, mm -hmm. Stacey. So maybe we'll go on that route just sure. for a little bit. Um, Paula Shore from Surrey, BC asks, what career path some of these women took maybe in using some of those three examples that you had well it's interesting isn't it because one of the women molly uh, sorry uh, minnie gray definitely took her vocational training and used it to do something that maybe she wouldn't have gotten to do um, otherwise uh, molly lamb was already kind of on her career path right she was an artist she was trained but her war service absolutely helped her post-war career um, she said so herself there, there's no doubt um, but for someone like Willa Walker, who came from a, a bit of a higher social class, she doesn't, she doesn't really have a career after the war, as far as I know. And if her family wants to, to correct me, please do. Um, but she raises a family. She does the traditional stuff, right? Um, and a lot of women did that. Uh, once they were discharged from the military, the 1950s, a lot of people retired and wanted to raise a family and have a peaceful, calm life. We think about the 1950s as a time of prosperity and people, you know, the nuclear family. So while some women absolutely did use their military experience to um, further a peacetime career, many others did not. And many others could not. There's a woman in, 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 in our book, um, Lorna Stanger, who was a naval photographer. And she really wanted to continue that career after the war, but there were just no jobs for photographers for women in the 1950s. So she went back to her public service job eventually once she was allowed to because she was married. And of course, there was, there was a rule until uh, some point in the 1950s, I think, uh, for federal civil servants for women. Right. But yeah, so I think, it's, I think it tends to be in an individual basis, whether we can say mm -hmm. uh, the military helped or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question uh, from Joel Watson in Ottawa, uh, where you are, Stacey, um, picking up on, on a similar point. Um, do you have a sense of a percentage or even rough numbers of how many service women continued serving in the military after the war? Well, the, the service branches that I discussed tonight, they were all disbanded in 1946. Um, I mean, it was understood when they were created that this was just for the duration of the war. But... As the Cold War started to heat up in the early 50s, that's when they started recruiting women again, uh, you know, the Korean War and what and stuff that, that, that just kept getting, you know, the Cold War became more of, a, of, a, of an intense uh, fact of life. Uh, that's when the, the military branches started bringing women back because they needed them. So Canada had commitments now because of the Cold War and um, this was going to be helpful. Um. Next question from Nathan Hiller. Um, what types of kind of service recognition in terms of medals were women awarded after the war? Uh, well, they got the standard uh, service medals. Uh, I'm not a medals person, so I can't, <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Uh, but they, of course, didn't receive, I mean, some of the nurses received the, um, the Royal Red Cross for exceptional service. Um, but of course, Valor medals are generally given out for combat-related uh, feats, right? And women were not in combat, so they tended to receive uh, the service medals, you know, for the, uh, the different types of, uh, the ones that, that, that uh, a man who wasn't in combat would have received as well. Um, I just saw an interesting question here, a little bit off topic, um, from uh, Al McCalder uh, from Sherwood Park, Alberta. Um, 
he's wondering if you are at all able to comment on how the role of women in the military has changed from the Second World War up to the present day. Wow. Well, it's definitely expanded. And I think that you have to look at the women of the Second World War services as laying a foundational block, right? They're there until 1946, but they really set a precedent. They're brought back in during the Cold War and over the decades. It, it took a long time. It wasn't until 1989, right, that women got theoretically on paper equality of opportunity in the Canadian forces. Uh, so it, it took decades, but that, 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 that foundation was laid by the women of the Second World War. Um, and their evolution within the Canadian military kind of mirrored their evolution in, in, in terms of women's rights in Canada. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm being a little rambly right now. That's all right. I'm just answering a, a few questions here um, over the... Uh... Um, over the chat. Uh, next question from Hal Friedman to you, Stacey. Um, was there any resentment amongst male military personnel in response to women taking over these roles and, and, and freeing up, quote unquote, uh, men for combat duty? What I've read, the reaction was a little mixed. Some men were really happy to see women coming in. Some men, there was some resentment. There was a little bit of, uh, of resentment and you could see that with Willa Walker. Um, mm -hmm. There was an anecdote that she told later on when she was trying to integrate some of the Air Force women into the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan facilities and onto bases. Um, she wasn't even allowed to eat in the officer's mess. She had to eat in her car to begin with because there was just, mm -hmm. you know, there was still that block, right? There was still that, that, that reluctance to bring women in. Um, some men are really happy to see women coming in because a lot of men, especially stationed in Britain for several years, uh, hadn't seen Canadian women. And when they started to come over, uh, it was great to have a, a friendly face from home. Um, but for other men, yeah, it meant that you were probably going to be sent closer to the front line, which and all its attendant dangers. So mm -hmm. I would say mixed. But once the women started proving themselves, once the women started showing that they could do this work and do it very competently, um, it was far easier. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to the post-war period again. Um, this next question came, comes from James Higginson Rollins. Um, did women receive the same benefits as men did after the war in terms of, you know, veteran rehabilitation, um, vocational training? I know you mentioned Minnie Gray was able to, to, to access that and make good use of it. But were there, um, were they given equal access to these types of programs as men did? Uh, yeah, on paper they were, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were given equal equal benefits. Uh, now, whether or not that actually meant equal benefits in practice, I'm not so sure. But um, right. yeah, they were they were afforded the same you know, educational opportunities. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure it's Minnie Gray, right? That's her first yeah. name. Mini okay, Eleanor good. Gray, yeah. Yes. Um, I couldn't remember as Minnie or Eleanor. Um, well, she added what, Eleanor. She she actually took that as her, her middle name after the war. So her name right. is actually Minnie Gray, but. Right. Um, I'm curious, uh, speaking of, of, of Minnie Gray, did she ever remark in her, um, in her diaries or anything else about any racism that she experienced while serving overseas? You know, not really, and I may have I may have skipped over it, but um, it's interesting that there isn't much in there about that, and I wonder if I wonder why that is, and and is that because she had to have encountered some discrimination? I mean, it's it's almost impossible to think that she didn't, mm -hmm. but for some reason she's trying not to dwell on that. Um, I, I really don't know why, but and I, of course I can't really speak to it um, myself, but. Yeah, no. Yeah, there's no indication that you can find anyways. Not really, no. Yeah. Um, we have to talk about the um, about Mary Lambeau back. The, the paintings and the drawings um, that you've included are just brilliant. Um, and so a question comes from uh, Sarah Hart, also from Ottawa, um, specifically about Mary Lambeau back. 
um, and asking if her style of art was at all influenced um, by photography, given that she was mentored by Alex Jackson, um, who was known to use photography in his early work or any other influences that you can pick up. I don't know about the photography. You'll notice, you know, Molly Lamb's style is very, it's not, it's figurative, but it's not, um, it's not realistic, right? She's got some, some very stylistic stuff going on. Her mm -hmm. faces of the people in her, in her, in her paintings aren't distinct. Um, I don't know about, about photography so much. Um, Private Roy though, that painting, I know that she mentioned uh, Cezanne's influence uh, and that one you can kind of see uh, the way she's composed the painting. Um, but she was mentored uh, also by Jack Shadbolt, who was an official war artist. He was one of her teachers at mm -hmm. the Vancouver Art School. So uh, he was some someone that uh, that influenced her style and influenced uh, her, her later art for sure. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure about photography. That's a really good question. Um, to look that up. Okay. Um, I'm curious, did she at all remark or do you have any record of her... Um, relationship with uh, A.Y. Jackson? Uh, she really liked A.Y. Jackson. She kind of just sort of would, 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 you know, burst in on him with a bottle of wine when she was in Toronto. And and, uh, and he really liked her too. And he was actually, he had a lot of influence on the official war art program. And she always kind of thought that maybe he had given her that that extra push to get her in the program. They had a really good relationship, kind of avuncular um, and, and uh, her father's influence too had to have helped. He was very well connected uh, in the, with the Canadian art scene. So, and she also hung out with H.O. McCurry. And while she was in Ottawa, she would visit with him. Um, right. So she definitely networked her way into a position, but you know, that's fine. Everyone does that, right? That's, that's, yeah. that's part of life. And um, yes. yeah. Did, was there any sort of negative response to, to her being included in the official war art program as the only woman? You know, I, 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 I feel like I'm saying I don't know about all these questions, but um, I don't know. I do know that it, it certainly was uh, something that made the newspapers. Oh, look, woman war artist. So she <laughs> right. definitely stood out, right? Um, she was the only woman and she was the only woman in uniform. Well, she was the only woman. Um, so she was definitely uh, a sensation, right? Um, and you can see that a lot with the way the women's services are portrayed in the media. This is new. This is a novelty. Look, they have a pipe band. Look, they have a war artist, you know, um, and part of it is propaganda. Mm. I think part of it is genuine. This is something new. This is something different. And you know, not everybody reacted in a good way, but I think when it comes to art and Molly Lamb, especially because she had such a, an amazing personality from what I've read and from what I've heard from others, very, um, down to earth and, and very, um, she had a great sense of humor. And mm -hmm. I encourage everyone to look up her, her illustrated war diary that, that LAC has. It's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, maybe I'll, I'll see if I can track that down while uh, you're answering the next question, sure. uh, Stacy. Um, but it's continuing on uh, Molly Lambobak's story. I'm curious, have you at all um, been able to think about um, kind of her evolution as an artist from the beginning of the war all the way to the end? Well, um, well, it's interesting. She, later on in her career, she sort of became obsessed, like after the war, with crowds and flowers. And you could kind of see that prefigured in some of her works. Um, but her works really did try to reflect what she was seeing around her as a CWAC. Um, and it's part of what makes her work special is that this is a perspective that we don't really have in Second World War, war art. Um, so really, it's not so much her style. She's, she's figuring out her way as a painter, her style as a painter. She's very young, remember? She's just come out of art school. So she's experimenting. Um, she has, um, if you look at Private Roy and you look at some of the other works, they're very different. Mm -hmm. um, so this is her, I think, feeling her way as an artist, right? So she's using her, her, her wartime experience to do that. And it really helped her. Um, she came out of the war with a, with a much higher profile. It helped, you know, um, catapult her in, into the world of art. Right. Um, I am 
I may have been able to find it. I think the problem is, is that Library and Archives Canada just trans transitioned oh, to yeah. a new website <laughs> did, yesterday. Yes. <laughs> and so all of the Google uh, results basically push you back to its homepage, to its new landing page. So I'll keep looking, but I may not be able to find it tonight for folks. Um, but it was, it's Molly Lambobak's Illustrated War or Illustrated Diary, you said, right? Uh, yeah, her ward, her ward diary. I should have put a... Um... Mm. Put a, a section of it up in the PowerPoint, but yeah, I'll uh, I'll keep looking for it um, while you while you while you answer uh, the questions here. But um, there's a, a big question for you, Stacy, um, <laughs> coming here again from from someone who has not entered their name in, um, but something I'm sure you thought a lot about in both your um, master's and your PhD research. Um, do you consider uh, service women's involvement at all? an important watershed moment in oh, yeah. women's history of Canada and Canadian history. And if it at all had a contribution to second wave feminism in the post-war period in the 1960s and seventies. It had to, it had to, I mean, I've already said that they've, they've laid, they laid that foundation stone for women in the military. And in terms of women in society in general, um, it's true that a lot of the women who served um, after the war, they kind of go back to that mm -hmm. traditional realm. They get married, they raise families. But when you think about it, um, their daughters would have heard mom's stories about being in the service, but you know, being at war. And they're the ones who started start to push in the 60s and 70s that second wave feminism that starts um, improving rights for women in Canada. So I think there's a direct, not a direct line, but kind of a, a generational thing going on here where uh, it's that next generation that maybe gets pushed along by what their mothers did. Does that make sense? Yeah. hundred um, percent. I just can't find the, the darn thing oh, on the new website. So um, yeah, just a reminder that if you are looking around Library and Archives Canada's new collection search page and you're interested in this, uh, the work that Stacy's been doing um, and Molly, Molly Lamb Bomback, Bomback in particular, um, you can find her, um, her war diary illustrated if you search it um, on uh, their Also, um, if I can plug the Canadian War Museum collection yes. search website, um, Please do. a lot of Molly's works are up there um, and they're just fantastic. So you just go to the collection search site and type in Molly Lamb Bobak and her works will pop up and they are fantastic. And we also have a, um, an online exhibition uh, that I curated a few year, a couple of years ago um, that uh, shows off a lot of her work and that also talks about her war story. So uh, that's something people can, can, can look at as well. I'm just uh, typing in the collection search link for everybody. Um, I have a, a couple of questions myself about the post-war period again. Um, oh, look at that. Sarah Hart has actually found uh, the link <laughs> to, uh, to Bobak's diary. Um, I am going to copy that and put it into the chat for everyone. Sorry, I'm all over the place, everyone, but we got to find, we got to get those resources. It's harder to share when you're not in person, this sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, in the chat, I just shared it. Thanks very much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Um, you can uh, find um, Bobax, Lamb Bobax um, uh, diary. Um, so yeah, back to the, to the post-war period again, Stacey. Um, I'm curious at all, particularly about um, Willa Walker's experience, uh, given that her, her husband was a POW. Was there any indication that she you know, reflected on her relationship with her husband or if her husband, there was any accounts of him having experienced any sort of post-traumatic stress or anything like that related to his experiences during the war? Uh, I'm not sure. He actually published a memoir of his war service. Oh, and I, the, the, the title escapes me now because um, mm -hmm. he became a novelist and, and he wrote about his experiences. It's interesting. Willa Walker is rather more enigmatic Um she didn't leave as many personal reflections as some of these other women did. And I wonder if that's because she was an officer and such a high ranking officer, she maybe felt that it wasn't her place. I, I don't know. Um, but no, I don't know uh, necessarily if he had any struggles with PTSD, but um, perhaps his memoir could, could answer that question. Um, again, Google would, would help there. Uh, David Harry Walker. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
because he was held in some pretty and he he escaped several times actually made it outside the wire and was brought back and he spent time in Colditz. um so he he definitely and he was there for many years because he was captured at dunkirk so mm -hmm. he had a lot of time to think up clever ways and before she joined enlisted in the, the air force she actually tried to help him by sending him coded letters and maps and whatnot so right yeah um back to the to the war itself uh stacy a question from robert smale um was there any indication that you have found that there were discussions in within the upper levels of the military to allow to allow women to serve in combat roles like they did in the soviet forces for example obviously a completely different context um but if there has been if there was any indication that they were having these discussions at higher levels i haven't seen any and it would really surprise me um if there were canada just seemed so reluctant to bring women in um much more reluctant than other countries. You're, you're right. Soviet women were in combat. They were fighter pilots. They were there was mm -hmm. the Soviet women's battalion of death, I think, in the First World War. I mean, and in Britain right. also, they had women's services in the First World War and in the Second World War at the very beginning of the Second World War. And it took Canada several years to even get on board with non-combatant women who were not nurses serving. So it would really surprise me if there was any discussion of women being in combat roles. Um, and I would love to be wrong. I would love for somebody to unearth something that, that would prove me wrong, but that would, that would just shock me personally. Right. Okay. Um, there's a, a second question from James Higginson uh, Rollins. Um, and he and I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit because he's hoping he's asking me, I think, um, if there's any kind of plans to talk about the home front experiences of women during the Second World War, particularly um, around kind of, you know, making munitions, working in the munitions factories, um, other sort of wartime industries. Could you speak at all to maybe some numbers um, in terms of women's um, involvement in wartime industries on the home front and what sort of roles they would have played? Um, yeah in these industries? Yeah, we actually, in our uh, in our book, Material Traces of War, there's, there's I think, <laughs> I can't remember, four sections, <laughs> one of which is military service and uh, one of which is, is women in the workforce. So we have stories in there about women in the Second World War who worked in uh, munitions factories, um, women who, who, who worked as, uh, there's a woman in there who worked as a, um, she crafted artificial eyes for veterans um, very interesting stuff. Interesting. Now, yeah, the women's workforce, I think, doubled from about 600,000 women to 1.2 women, uh, million women in the workforce during the Second World War. So there was a huge influx uh, of women into all sorts of industries uh, during the war because so many men, I mean, we had a military that was over a million people. So that was a lot of um, a lot of vacant jobs that had to be filled. So women weren't just going into the military. Many more women stayed on the home front and supported the war effort uh, mm -hmm. in jobs or simply as volunteers. I mean, volunteerism was huge during both World War efforts. Mm -hmm. Women raised money. Um, they, they, they canvassed for all sorts of causes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, there's many more stories about women in the workforce in our book. Yes, of course. And I, I, I've, I've sent it in the chat a couple of times, but I just want to remind folks that we do have Stacy's uh, most recent book, Material Traces of War, available for 20% off tonight through the University of Ottawa Press website. Um, I'll share the link with you one more time and the code to enter when you do so. But if you enjoyed tonight's talk and you know you want to learn some more, not only about service women, but also uh, women who um, you know worked on the home front in these industries and in other roles on the home front, I'd really encourage you to, to take a look at her book i'm sure it will be um i'm sure it'll be fascinating and, and well illustrated as well given how given the presentation tonight um let's get back to the questions we got about 10 minutes left so perhaps i will try to fit in three maybe four more questions we'll see how quick we can get through them um and then we'll wrap things up right around nine o'clock um where we go. Yes. Yeah, so the next question comes from Marie Sterling. Um, and she she says that she served in the military during the Cold War. And I know that you've already um, kind of 
established the importance of, you know, Canadian service women in the Second World War kind of laid a foundation, right, for future women um, in not only service roles, but also um, just in general Canadian society, right? Um, but she, given that she had served in the military during the Cold War, um, she's curious what would have been different between the Second World War experience and the Cold War experience of a Canadian service woman. Wow. Um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll preface that by saying I'm, I'm not a Cold War historian. So, <laughs> um, uh, well, I think I think in general, uh, the differences would have been, you know, in the 1940s, it's the 1940s. Women are still making headlines if they wear pants, right? So there's right. definitely going to be a change in attitude towards women doing anything mm -hmm. uh, in what was considered masculine, the masculine realm. Mm -hmm. Um I'm guessing that things shifted quite a bit during the Cold War, but perhaps not as much as we see today uh, when we do have equality of service, on paper at least. Um, but remember, in the 1940s, women weren't doing this. I mean, this was all very new. Um, and by the time the Cold War rolls around, we've seen that women can serve in the military and they can mm -hmm. offer something and they can do so um, competently. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I can't really answer that question because I don't actually know a lot about the... Um, the post-war uh, military. You'd have to ask my, my colleague, Andrew Birch at the Canadian War Museum. I just, yes. uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I got another question here from James Maxfield. He's tuning in from Sarnia. Um, and he's curious, and I think I can I can answer part of the question because I know that during the First World War and the Second World War, nursing sisters would have been officers um, mm -hmm. and would have been superior to the men um, in terms of ranking um, when uh, they were they were um, treating privates, for example, in hospitals. Mm -hmm. But his question is: Were there other instances in which women? Uh, would have received commissions or were officers and were um, technically superior in, superior in rank to men um, and would have men would have reported to them, for example. Um, during the Second World War? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm assuming that uh, men would, who are of a lower rank would have definitely respected the fact that the women mm -hmm. had a higher rank. Um, right. But when you talk about nurses, um, their officer status kind of, their authority over the men kind of ended outside of the hospital, right? Yeah. They were given officer rank for a very specific purpose. Um, right. When you're a patient, you're going to obey this nurse because she's an officer, you might not be. Um, yes. But in terms of commanding men, I'm not entirely sure that the women of the Second World War service branches would have been commanding men. Uh, they mm -hmm. definitely would have com been commanding other women. Right. And if you were a private walking down the street and you happen to see, say, Willow Walker, wing officer walking towards you, I think you probably would have definitely raised your hand in salute. But whether right. or not she would have ever been able to. Uh, it's a tough question. It's a tough question. Right. Tough questions right. tonight, guys. <laughs> and some good answers, I think, too. Um, this has been a great Q&A. Um, we only have. Well, actually three more questions on the docket here. So why don't we try to get through them um, in our remaining seven minutes? Um, Question from Ken Bridges. Do you have a sense of how soon women arrived in Europe after D-Day in 1944? Oh, after D-Day. Well, you'll notice there are pictures of nurses arriving very soon after D-Day. Uh, again, if you go on to LAC, there's a lot of uh, right. women actually arriving fairly quickly, I mean, weeks sometimes only after uh, the initial, after D-Day. Um, in terms of CWACs, as I said before, they tended to keep them out away from the theaters of war, uh, the service right. women who weren't nurses. Um, I think some nurses were, uh, some CWACs were posted to Italy in 1944, uh, but they would not have been sent to areas of active combat. And it would have, would have been after the war ended, that they would have seen them there. Okay. So not very many at all. Right. Not very many at all. Um, it's a, this is a more specific question for you, Stacey, uh, from John Reed. Um, he's curious if any Canadian women ended up delivering aircraft from factories to operational airports like what happened in the UK. Oh, Atta Girls, the ATA? Yeah. Yeah, there were uh, a few Canadian women who uh, flew for the ATA um, and a, flew, a few women who were British but then later moved to Canada. Uh, one Sadly, just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Jay Edwards, 
also known as um, uh, Stella Peterson when she was flying. And she was a British woman who, who flew for the ATA. She was 103 when she just passed away. Um, but yeah, there were a few, um, not too many though. Um, and of course, women in the RCAF, WDs, did not fly. Women in the Navy did not serve on boats. They would serve on stone frigates. Um, so you see that the restrictions were still there, right? Right. There, there were still... You were still being put in your particular place as a service woman. There were things that you were not going to do. Mm -hmm. um, this last question, and I think I might even fit one more question in at the end, um, because there is only, we still have five minutes left, and this is the final question from the audience. <laughs> um, Dave Alexander, longtime attendee of the Maple Leaf Route, one, of Maple Leaf Route webinar series, longtime patron of the Laurier Center. Um, his question, and it, this is specific to his research, because I know that he um, does a lot of research himself on high schools and the world wars. Um, and he wonders if you could, if you have any ideas or suggestions on res on resources that researchers might be able to use to do um, research on the stories of women who served during the Second World War, mm -hmm. coming from you know particular schools or even from smaller local communities. Oh gosh, well there are actually a lot of resources that you can. I mean, um, the Canadian War Museum, first of all. Um, our, our, our collection search will, will bring you um, a lot of uh, different stories of women who served. Mm -hmm. Library and Archives Canada, um, newspapers. Uh, I get a lot of information. Uh, historians yep. use newspapers a lot, newspapers.com. Um, yes. There's actually also, while the service records from the Second World War are still closed and probably will be for some time, um, the uh, records of those who died in service are available. And you there are actually... I think there were, oh, I won't, I won't give you a number because it'll be wrong, but there are uh, some records for service women who died in service available, and you can get those through LAC or through Ancestry if you have an Ancestry account. Uh, yeah. A lot of good stuff on there. Fold3, which is a, a military genealogy site that you can subscribe to is good as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but th there's, there's tons of stuff out there, and if he, he wants more ideas... Drop me your email and I'll, I'll write something up. Yes. And if, if folks have, you know, more questions for Stacy that maybe come, came to you later uh, when you're laying in bed, pondering the talk um, or um, weren't able to ask in the, uh, in the Q and a, please do just forward them to me and I'm happy to forward them along to, uh, to Stacy and she will get back to you when she has uh, the time to do so. Um, three more minutes left. So Stacy, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we can wrap things up. Do we have any information about Private Roy, who she was, what her service was like, even what her post-war experience was like? We do have her service file. Um, uh, I, she actually tried uh, to uh, join the army show, like the entertainment unit, but she was turned down and yeah. it was probably because she was black. Um, mm. We do know that she was possibly posted to posted overseas uh, that Private Royce uh, painting may have been from a sketch that Molly Lamb did while she was overseas. It may also have been done in Halifax, but the question's still up in the air. Uh, we actually do have a couple of uh, items for from her service in the uh, museum collection from her family. We don't have a ton of information about her, no, but her family's out there. And, um, mm. you know, if, if somebody, I think someone's doing research on her a filmmaker that I've been in contact with okay. as well. Yeah. So if, if, if you'd like to know more, I think I can, um, you can get that. Sure. Well, Stacy, I just want to say thank you so very much uh, for agreeing to, uh, to this talk tonight and for giving such a tremendous talk um, so much color, so much detail. Um, but you know, the, the, I think, this is my personal opinion, but I'm sure I speak for a number of folks that tuned in tonight. Just hearing about those personal stories is, I think, what really makes history rewarding and interesting to listen to. Um, so thank you so much for sharing the stories of these three these three um, Canadian service women of the Second World War. No problem. I enjoy talking about them. Well, everyone... I can't believe it, but that actually marks the end of our sixth and final webinar in the Maple Leaf Route webinar series. We've gone through last summer with the first season, um, given the pandemic, given that 
organizations like the Canadian Battlefields Foundation weren't able to send students overseas. Um, we hope that in lieu of not being able to send students overseas, um, that the Maple Leaf Route webinar series was able to fill that void in some small way um, over these past two summers. And I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in, not only this summer, uh, this spring, but also last year, to hear about Canada's role in the Second World War last year in the Battles of Normandy and this year in various themes and ways uh, that Canada contributed to the Second World War. For those who didn't get a chance to see all of this season's webinars, and for those who might even be interested in catching up on last season's Maple Leaf Route webinar series, again on the Battles of Normandy, you can find all of those videos recorded and posted to YouTube on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll promise to, to share the, the, that link with you uh, when I wrap things up here. Before we go, I'd like to thank in particular our sponsors, the Canadian Battlefields Foundation and the Juno Beach Centre Association for their support throughout the series. Without them, we honestly could not have done anything close to what we've been able to do over the past two summers. In particular, I'd like to thank um, Alex Fitzgerald Black, the director of the Juno Beach Center, uh, for supporting us and encouraging us to do this series over the past two years. Um, Keegan, uh, who was the uh, one of the summer students um, who worked with us closely this year. Thank you. And the other students whose names just, they escape me right now, and I'm sorry that I cannot remember them, but for those who um, were working last year and helped us put together the first season, thank you very much. From the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, of course, thanks to Christian, thanks to Jeff, and thanks to Ken. Again, just like the Juno Beach Centre, we could not have done the series um, as we did over the past two seasons without you. One last time, if you enjoyed tonight's webinar and would like to know more about what is happening at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada, at the end of this webinar, when you exit it, you will be directed to our website. Scroll to the bottom of the page and enter in your contact information, your name and your email. And from us, you will see receive periodic emails um, regarding webinars such as this, uh, in-person lecture series, podcasts, publications, and our annual colloquium. Um, and speaking of which, actually, um, the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada is going to be returning to in-person lectures in September this year. This is actually going to be our last exclusively virtual webinar. Um, Terry Kopp will be speaking about his newest book, Montreal at War, 1914 to 1918, on September 29th. Doors will open at 6.30 p.m. at our location at 232 King Street North in Waterloo, and the event will begin at 7 o'clock. So please do come. I'm really looking forward to seeing folks. It's been so, it's been too long, far, far too long uh, that I haven't been able to see you all in person. And for those who are unable to attend um, in person, of course, we have, we will make sure, we have made sure, I should say, um, that these events will be recorded and broadcast live. So those not in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, those unable to attend these webinars or these in-person lectures will still be available uh, for you to watch live and, of course, on YouTube afterwards. Again, I would really like to thank everyone for tuning in. It's been a wild ride. It's been a fun ride. I've learned a lot. I hope you have all learned a lot um, throughout the past two summers. And I hope that it's kind of pushed you to maybe explore some more Second World War history uh, and Canada's role in it um, beyond the lecture series or beyond the lectures that we've provided over the past two years. With that, I will let you all go. Thank you all for tuning in. Take care, and we'll hopefully see you again in September for our in-person lectures that will also be broadcast. Take care, everyone. Good night.